All right, welcome back to another Chemistry 111 answer key. Uh, we've got an exam coming up this week, and so we want to, you know, build that confidence. And one of the ways you can do that is by solving these practice problems that I handed out in class. And so again, you want to really transition to avoiding using your notes. You know, having people help you. You know, the exam is going to be you and and you alone. So you got to be able to tackle these problems on your own and, and build the confidence so you keep your stress down during the exam. And so I hope some of these problems will help you do that. And so I thought we could run through them. It's, you know, it's about four pages, two pages front and back, you know, about as long as your exam will be. So this might be a little bit longer uh, video. So feel free to use a little slider down below there to uh, zoom ahead or um, you know slow down in certain areas where you think you need more help and you know either bypass or fast forward to uh, past the ones you already know pretty well so this first one I think uh, was a little bit confusing for some of you but I think this is a really good uh, accuracy and precision question you know relating to some of the things we've been doing in lab and so again the idea of you know definitions of accuracy and precision what does that mean and so here we can put um, you know, an applied um, problem to, to illustrate this. And so here we've got uh, a juvenile uh, diabetes clinic. And so this is a real world kind of problem. And so you need to deliver one dose, right? So this one unit dose is our target, or actually this would be probably uh, more specifically said, this is our quote unquote true value, right? So we want to deliver 1.00 units as a dose. And we have two options. We have the Novapen and we have a traditional syringe. And if you look, we're given some data. And so the average, right, our average is our, our mean. And so the Novapen delivers on average. And how many trials do we have? Well, we have five trials. So in this case, N equals five, right? That's important to read in here and know what's going on. And of those five trials, um, our average is 0.89 for the Novapen and 1.23. Uh, for the um, syringe and so we're also given the standard deviation and in this case already you can kind of tell uh, the standard deviation for this syringe is, is you know essentially more than double uh, the deviation of the Nova pin and then finally you're given the 95 percent confidence of interval and so for the syringe we're already given this value right we can write the experimental value in the form of the mean plus or minus that 95% CI uncertainty value. And so we can go ahead and write that, right? We can say 1.23 plus or minus 0 0.1, and that's gonna be, our unit here is doses, right? So, or units, if you will, whatever you wanna call it, units uh, slash, slash doses, right? So units, whatever you wanna call it. And so um, there's our mean and our 95% CI, so that's given to us. And in this one, we don't know what it is, and so we need to calculate that. And on your equation sheet, you're given the 95% CI value, and, or equation rather, and that 95% CI is simply equal to what? That's equal to the T value that you'll go look up on the table that's provided. And how do you know which one to look up? Well, there were five trials, so you'll look that up. You're going to multiply it by the standard deviation, and the standard deviation is given to you right here. And then you're going to divide that by the square root of the number of trials, right? And so this is pretty easy. We just crank this out, grab everything that's there. If I look on the, the table of t values, I think I get 2.776 times the uh, standard deviation, 0 0.04. And there's you know one sig fig there that's important to note. And then we've got. Uh, square root of 5 and if I do my arithmetic correctly I think I got something in the order of 0 0.05 doses right and I'll go ahead and write that down it's good to write your units and so now I can write that value so for the Nova pin right for the Nova pin I can say okay well it's 0 0.89 plus or minus 0 0.05 doses or units, whatever you'd like to write down is fine. And now we can compare this value to the value up here. Right, we're looking at the syringe versus the Nova pin. And if you want me to, I can go ahead and write this into here so you can compare, but it's not that important right now. Okay, so if you think about these, and I, I really would like you to think about these maybe as a picture, right? So we have our syringe. And that syringe can do what? Well, it can deliver 
somewhere between what? You've got your uh, average right, which is 1.23, and if you know that this, the 95% CSCI is plus or minus 0.1, that means we could have our mean and we could deliver you know, 1.33 if we add that value, and we can deliver, what is that, it's gonna be, uh, what do we got here, 1.13 if we uh, if we have or shy that much and so if you think about the amount delivered by the syringe it's a pretty broad range right because it's plus or minus 0.1 which means it's a whole 0.2 range and so we can say the range is in essence our uh, notation or evaluation for precision and I would argue that's that's pretty wide in terms of accuracy does it deliver uh, one unit well one would be down here, right? 1.00 is down here, so we're we're a little ways off. I would say this is not the most accurate. It's close, but it's it does that 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 interval does not include uh, the actual true value. Now let's look at the Nova pin or the Novo pin, and we say, okay, well its average or mean is 0 0.89 doses, right? And if you go up by 0.05 that's going to give you what? That's going to give you uh, 0. Uh, let me write this on the bottom here. Uh, 0. 0.94, right? And if you are shy by that much, it'd be 0. 0.84, right? And again, this is one where you're like, okay, well the the range is considerably tighter than the syringe, and so the Nova pin is more precise. And if we were to look at accuracy, 1.00 is still slightly outside that range. Neither of them has the actual target or true value of 1.00 in their value, in their range. So that's a little concerning, but if I were to, to judge which one is more accurate, I would say this one is 0.13 away from that range from the true value, and this one's only 0.06. So if I had to declare a winner, I would say the Nova pin is more accurate, but neither of them is all that great, but the precision of the Nova pin is where it really shines. And so here you can talk about precision being the range of your data or your statistics, and the accuracy being how close that interval comes to the true value. And I hope that, that helps clear some of that confusion up. All right, the second one here is really just a dimensional analysis problem, right? We're saying, okay, well, we got 115 miles in a day for a sailboat. So we can say, okay, well, let's convert that to meters per second, right? So that means we're gonna have to think about going from miles in a day, so we've gotta convert our units of length from miles to meters and we've got to convert our units of time from days to seconds. This is pretty straightforward if you've been keeping up in class and I'll, I'll set it up like this. I'll go 115. There are three sig figs there. I'll make sure I keep note of that uh, miles per day and I know this is dimensional analysis so I'm going to go ahead and kind of just write my uh, big bracket here so I can begin to cancel things out. And I'll say, okay, well, I want to go ahead and convert my my length. And I'll say, okay, well, if I think about this, I'll, I can go to conversion factors, and what 1.00 uh, miles is effectively what uh, 1,609 meters. And if I look at that, okay, I've canceled my miles, and so now I'm in meters, which is where I want to be for length. Now I need to convert days to seconds. That's not too hard, right? By definition, one day is 24 hours. So that gets rid of my days. Now I'm stuck with, I don't want meters per hour, so I need to maybe go and get rid of my hours by saying that there are 60 minutes in an hour. So that gets rid of my hours. I don't want meters per minute, so I need to go one more step and say for every one minute, there are 60 seconds and those will cancel so now I'm left with meters on the top and seconds on the bottom which means my units are correct in meters per second and there are no squares or cubes here these are all uh, straight up linear values so I don't have to worry about that and if I did my number crunching right which I hope I did uh, I get 2.14 meters per second and 
here I can count one, two, three sig figs, which is the value given in my um, my value there for the problem. And nothing else confines me. These these down here are definitions. So these are you know it's 24.000000. So these these don't restrain me. These are not really two sig figs because these are formal definitions. And and there we go. And the last one on this page talks about the three kinds of radiation. We've talked about these in class, right? The, the biggest one that you have is the alpha, which is a helium nucleus, right? That's alpha radiation, alpha particles. Um, these are big, bulky um, particles. They can do a lot of damage if they get inside you. So if you were to ingest or to be injected with something that had alpha particle, as a decay product, you would be in big trouble because these can tear up uh, DNA and stuff by collisions and all kinds of nastiness that can happen to you. Um, so these are dangerous if you eat them or if you get uh, injected with them, but if they're just flying around in the environment, your skin will easily stop them, your clothes will stop them, no big deal. Uh, beta particles, right, are essentially what? A high energy electron, that's beta. And these are more dangerous because I would argue in an alpha just in the environment because they are more penetrating, right? You gotta be careful. You don't want those to get, um, get after you. You don't wanna be exposed to these if you don't have to. So more penetrating, more dangerous. And then finally, right, this is gonna be your gamma, which is a, a high energy photon, right? Uh, very dangerous here, right? Gamma can really mess you up. Gamma, in order to stop gamma, what do you need? You need thick lead walls and um, you know containment concrete blocks and all kinds of stuff. Gamma is very penetrating, easily one of the most dangerous if you're exposed to it in the environment. So uh, really scary. You don't want to be anywhere near these if you can avoid them, but especially gamma is, is really nasty. All right, next page. Let's go ahead and move along. We're making good progress here. Uh, described how the model of the atom has changed over time and provide three experiments or key observations that have driven this change. Well, you know, this is a long story. I'm not going to be able to go over here over all the stuff we talked about. But remember back in the Greek, uh, uh, the Greek times, right, in the ancient times, we had Democritus, right? Um, Democritus talked about the idea of things being indivisible, right? The idea of atomos, right? Uh, we talked about that a little bit. Um, now, this is not so helpful for our modern understanding, and so let's zoom ahead, right, a, a number of years, and I would argue we could get to something like, um, I don't know, remember we had the idea of Dalton? Remember, I think we talked about Dalton and his atomic theory, and this is in the, the early, you know, late 1700s, early 1800s, right? That was really important. And Dalton talked about you know atoms being indivisible. He didn't know about subatomic particles at the time, um, so we had a discussion there. Uh, if you zoom ahead a little bit, we have what we had the the J.J. Thompson right. So J.J. Thompson and his plum pudding right. Plum pudding. If we're here, if we're Yanks uh, across the pond here, we can talk about this as maybe a blueberry muffin, where you had what you had. If we don't want to draw a picture, we had you know this cloud of of, of you know charge here and, and and things kind of sprinkled around as if they were a blueberry muffin or a plum pudding model a food model there uh, you know not very helpful but not you know you had this kind of the masses delocalized in this kind of cloud thing with with various things spread around and and so that wasn't very helpful uh, in terms of our modern understanding I think it's really once we get to our friend Big R right Rutherford. Rutherford gives us the establishment of what? The nuclear model, right? Where you have the protons, especially in the nucleus, they have a positive charge, and then you have electrons out here. And the neat thing about this is that the mass is centered, uh, concentrated very strongly in the nucleus, and the electrons are kind of out here somewhere. Um, and that's a big shift. And then finally, the last shift I would think about um, I would argue probably is the idea of what well, we have Bohr and Schrodinger right and Heisenberg can mix in there where we have the same nuclear atom but now we think about the electrons as being uh, wave functions where we have high probability of finding them in these things called atomic orbitals right so 
Bohr had the OR bits, which were 2D paths, and I would I actually prefer to talk about the OR bitoles that Schrodinger talked about, right? These three-dimensional regions where we have a high probability of finding the electron, right? And these could be s orbitals or p orbitals, or we even talked about the d orbitals, right? That have these kind of balloon animal shapes, a sphere, a dumbbell, and a clover. And you know, again, you can go into much more detail here. You might have a couple of favorites like Chadwick and the discovery of the neutron, or all kinds of things that we really didn't talk about. Millikan, right, with the uh, charge to mass ratio. I mean, the, he determined the fundamental charge, which helped us go back to uh, looking at the cathode ray tubes and, and solving for that ratio and getting both the mass and the, the fundamental charge. And so all kinds of things happened here that we talked about. Um, you could even invoke some other things from your reading, but for right now, there's a there's just a lot you could have talked about. So you could have taken this answer. I would have probably gone with maybe, I don't know, I would have probably gone with uh, plum pudding with Thompson, Rutherford, and then Schrodinger if I were going to pick my top three, but it's totally up to you. All right, this next one I think is kind of challenging for some of you dealing with this radioactive decay. And so if you look at strontium 90, right, if you look at strontium on the periodic table, uh, its atomic uh, number is, I think, 38, if I can find my periodic table, and the uh, mass number is 90 and it says it decays via beta so you need to know what a beta particle is right so it's going to be um, zero negative one and so de again decay means it's going to kick off a beta particle and it has to balance right so that means it's going to be 39 and you're going to have a yttrium there and it's going to be 90 and so negative one plus 39 gives you 38 so there's a nice beta decay and this next question i really like is how do we solve for something that would be kind of important? So if you think about strontium-90, it's got a half-life of 30 years. That is intense. That's that's not good if you're a, a mammal like we are. And if, let's say we had, if you were able to, you know, this is a, a, a waste component of fallout and all kinds of reactor waste and whatnot. And if you were to have the poor luck of having some of this in your uh, food and you were to eat it, it could get into your bone tissue by replacing calcium. And this problem says if you have uh, with just one, one and a quarter milligrams in your bones and how much would be left after 40.5 40, 40 years? Well, let's take a look at this. And what key equations do you need? Well, you need two and they're both provided on the equation sheet. So you have to say, okay, well, I'll take the half-life equation, which is the natural log of however many are present at some time t, and that's gonna equal negative k is the rate constant times the time that he's elapsed, plus natural log of whatever amount you had initially. And that's all good and fine, but you, you, have, uh, you want to solve for how much is left at 40 years, right? So that's gonna go into here, and then you've got 1.25 milligrams initially so that's going to go into there so we're starting to knock out some of these variables we don't know this but this is what we want to find so that means if we have one equation and two unknowns we're kind of in trouble because we don't know k but remember that I was I was kind and I gave you the half-life so you can go to the other little equation right where the value of k is equal to the natural log of 2 over the half-life right so you can plug that value into there and I solve k equals uh, you can crank that out I get natural log of 2 divided by 29.1 years which means that the value of k in units are going to be 1 over years because natural log of 2 doesn't have a unit and I got something like 0 0.0238 1 over years that's important because that is K and you can now plug it into K. You solve all this and I, just to make things simple, I think I ended up getting natural log of N of, N of T equals negative uh, 0 0.965 plus 0 0.223. And you can get down here to natural log of N of T equals what negative 0 
Uh, the opposite of natural log is the exponential, so you take the exponential function and n sub t, which is how much is left after 40 uh, and a half years, I think I get something like 0 0.477 milligrams. And that's still a lot to have after 40 years, so that would, that would be pretty terrible if you got some of that in you. But uh, how can you check your answer? Well, let's, let's think about what goes on here. I'm going to go ahead and round this up and say 30 years is about a half-life. So this is somewhere between one and two half-lives. So if we take this value, 1.25 divided by half, then divide it by half again, we're going to be somewhere between one and two half-lives. So that, that seems like a reasonable answer. There we go. You can always kind of check yourself that way. Next one, uh, oh, these are good. Electron configurations are pretty easy. So we're going to look at this magnesium, and magnesium has 12 electrons, 2 plus, so we're going to remove 2. So it's going to be 10 electrons. And I'm going to say, OK, um, you can go ahead and, since this is a main group element, you can do it this way. But uh, transition metals, it's probably best to do the neutral atom. And the, you know what? I'm just going to go ahead and do it that way. So forgive me. I'm going to go ahead and do it the, the way that works for everything. So I'm going to go ahead and do the neutral atom first. So magnesium has 12 electrons, so there's 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and then uh, I'm going to go up to 3s2, and you're going to remove two electrons from the highest n value, so the highest n value is 3s, so I remove both of those, and what's left is my electron configuration for the cation. So there you go. You can, you can never miss a problem if you do it that way. And then iron is really simple, right? We can say uh, iron has what? We have about 26 electrons if you look at iron on the periodic table. 1s2, 2s2, you just really got to make sure to count here. Don't get these wrong. 3s2, 3p6. Use that periodic table to help you uh, figure out the order. So we've got 10 here, we've got 18. So we're going to go 4s2 because you fill that one first and then finally you come back to the d's and you get 3d6, so let's check that out. We've got what? We've got 10 here, we've got uh, 8 here, and we've got 8 here, so 16 plus 10 is 26. Boom. We got it. We're good. If you can do that, you're, you're sitting pretty. Okay. Halfway done. Let's go ahead and move along there. Um, this next one says sketch a diagram for the X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy instrument and label the major components. This was in your notes from today, so I'll, I'll go ahead and sketch it. But in, in essence, you've got an X-ray source, you know, your X-ray flashlight here, if you will. So we've got our X-ray source, and we're going to shoot those X-rays, right? Those are high-energy photons, and they're going to hit some sample, and that sample is most likely a solid. Um, it's going to hit boom, and then it has so much energy that it's going to kick out an electron. We call that a photoelectron. And we're going to have some big tube that's going to collect them and detect them. That's a detector, and it will tell us the energy of those electrons, right? So that way we know the energy of our X rays, we know the energy of our electrons, and so those energies should be should be equal except for the fact that that sample is holding on that to that electron and it's holding on with a force known as the binding energy also known you know often referred to as a, an ionization energy if you want to call it that the energy required to overcome that and knock that electron out so you can say okay well I know then that the energy of my x-ray is going to be equal to the energy of my detected electron plus the binding energy. So if you know that, you can take the x-ray energy minus the energy you detect over here and you can find the binding energy which is really pretty amazing. And if we want to give an example of that, we can look at magnesium and we already did the electron configuration for magnesium. We can go ahead and crank that out again. So we have 1s2 for neutral, right? Zero, no, no charge here. 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, and we're good. That's 12, right? 10 plus 2, there's our 12 electrons. And now you have to think about what's going on here. You've got the y-axis, which is essentially equal to a number of electrons, or a ratio of the number of electrons, and then binding energy, right? This is that 
BE, the binding energy. And so we can say, okay, which one's going to be the hardest to remove? Well, I would argue the core electrons closest to the nucleus. So I'm going to put me a, a peak way down here for my 1s. And I'm going to go ahead and put 1s2 because that would be a height of about two electrons, right? So that'd be about two electrons on my y axis. And then the distance between the energy required to remove an s and a, a 1s and a 2s, it's pretty big. So I'm going to leave a big gap. I'm going to do my best here and I'm going to say that's going to be my 2s and that's also two electrons so I'm drawing them about the same height and I got those knocked out and then my 2p we'll notice the energy difference here is going to get smaller so I'm going to draw a big old peak here it's terrible drawing I apologize uh, this is my 2p6 and that's going to be about six electrons high and then finally the energy oh no my peak disappeared there we go I'll draw it again sorry guys pins acting up there. So there's my big peak there for 2p6 and the only one left over is 3s and again it's going to be you know the energy differences get smaller as you go out that's going to be 3s2 and that's also two electrons in height so you know we can say our, our six electron height here we could say four electron height here and two electron height there we're good so one two three peaks with two one two three and then one peak with six and there we go again it gets harder to remove, requires more binding energy, right? You have to overcome more binding energy to remove the core electrons, the ones closer to the nucleus, and the easier it is, the further you get away. There we go. All right, this one here says rank the order, right? Rank the order here, and so it says increasing first ionization energy, and so um, what's happening here? We're looking at calcium, magnesium, and barium. Well, if you think about it, barium is the biggest, right? So if barium is the biggest, it's going to have the smallest energy penalty to remove an electron, right? If that electron's further away from the nucleus, i.e. barium's the biggest, the, the, the electron's going to be further away, it's going to be the easiest to remove, which means the smallest uh, ionization energy. Calcium's next because it's the medium one here. And then finally, the smallest atom is our friend magnesium, and it's going to have the biggest or the largest ionization energy because it's closest to the nucleus, trying to remove that electron. If we look at the largest radius, remember you've got fluorine neutral versus the negative one. So we've, if you think about it, we add an electron to go from neutral to plus. And if you add an electron, what have you done? You've packed in another particle that has a negative charge in order to reduce that repulsion, you've got to spread out. You've got to repel those electrons and make them spread out. And the only way to spread out is to make your sphere a little bit bigger. So that means anions are larger than the neutral um, original form because the more electrons you have, the more repulsion. So more repulsion they have to spread out and then that makes the sphere bigger and therefore the radius is larger. In this case this is the opposite right here we're gonna go from magnesium 0 to magnesium 2 plus and we've already seen this case we're gonna go from here to here on the previous page and we remove two electrons and we remove them remember from the 3s2 so that's gone so now we only have where we used to have n equals 3 and we've removed that so we've taken out a whole shell you removed, right, removed, remove the valence electrons. And if you do that, you remove a whole shell. So there goes n equals three. So that makes the atom or the ion is considerably smaller compared to the neutral uh, parent there. So we talked about these in class. I like this last problem. I think it's pretty cool. You say, are the sets of quantum numbers allowed? And you say, okay, well, let's think about this. Well, n equals 4, that's allowed, okay. L equals 0, that's an S, okay. N sub L, that's, that looks good. Uh, meets all the rules, so, oh, wait a minute, look at this monster. No, 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 remember electrons for M sub S can only be what? Positive 1 half or minus 1 half. It cannot be a negative 1, so there's a big error there. Nope, 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 you can't have that. This one, let's see, we got n equals 1, that makes sense. Oh, wait a minute here can you this would be right P can you have a 1p orbital no L is limited by n L the maximum value of L can be n minus 1 based on the rules that we've talked about so that cannot be possible uh, this would have to be 
L equals zero, which doesn't make, I mean, it would have to be a one S. You can't have a one P, that's not allowed. Ooh, and look at this one. Ah, if this is actually L equals zero, then M sub L has to be zero as well. There are all kinds of mistakes in this one. Um, not good. So these two are broken. They break the rules of uh, the quantum numbers, right? Because M sub L can only be minus L to zero to plus L when you're looking at the integers and and this is this is just full of mistakes that's not good so um, just know your rules for quantum numbers alright the very last page and we will be done I know this is getting a little bit long but again um, I think this is really important if we look at this first one it says don't do any calculations we have two transitions in the hydrogen atom and you know we can sit there and draw a little diagram like an orbital uh, diagram and we can say okay well you know we can use the Bohr atom right and we can say n equals 1 and then we can jump up here there's a big gap between n equals 1 and n equals 2 and then there's a smaller gap for n equals 3 smaller gap for n equals 4 and then finally n equals 5 so we could kinda draw it let me give you some more room there to see that um, as you go higher the energy levels start to get a little bit compressed right the gap becomes smaller and smaller and you can use that to your advantage you say five to one if our electron was up here and it fell all the way to one that's a big energy gap right our gap would be this delta E whereas if you're going from four to two that's a small gap so which one releases the highest energy photon well the biggest gap which would be five going to one that's really important. Again, no calculation. And this one says without doing any calculations again, which one's going to have the lowest frequency? Now remember, energy is related to Planck's constant times the frequency. So it's directly related to the frequency. So high frequency, high energy, low frequency, low energy. So it wants to know which one does the lowest energy. Well, that's going to be 4 to 2. This one, uh, again, no calculation. Which one gives you the shortest wavelength? Okay, well remember E equals HC over lambda, right? As a consequence of the fact that the speed of light is equal to the frequency times the wavelength. And so energy is inversely proportional to wavelength. So as wavelength goes down, energy goes up. So the shortest wavelength is the highest energy. And that's like that. There we go. This next one wants us to calculate some energy. Okay, we can do that. If we say we're going to go from n equals 4 to n equals 2, that's electron falling down, right? So n equals 4 falling to n equals 2, which means that it's going to emit a photon of energy h nu, or frequency times Planck's constant. Okay, we can deal with that. And the calculation that we're given, right, for Bohr's equation, if we know where it's falling, we can say that's going to be equal to, uh, what, the Rydberg constant here, uh, 178 times 10 to the negative 18. Make sure you write your units, joules, that's going to be really important, times what? 1 over n final squared minus 1 over n initial squared. And you can plug these in, right? So you get the final would be, uh, what is that? It's going to be 2 squared, and this one's going to be 4 squared. And you crank those out, and I think I get something like uh, 4.084 times 10 to the negative 19th joules. Now, you want to start, as you solve more and more of these problems, a joule per what? Well, this is a joule for actually one photon, right? Because we're talking about one photon that's being kicked out. This is a really small number, but that makes sense because one photon doesn't have a whole lot of energy. But if you had a whole bunch of them, like if you had a whole Avogadro's amount of them, you could multiply it by Avogadro's number and it would make more sense. But for right now, just realize that one photon is going to have a really small amount of energy. 10 to the negative 19th is pretty small. But you'll start to realize that these photons do have around 10 to the negative 18, 10 to the negative 20th range. And so if you're looking at numbers like this, that means you're probably in the right area. 
And now we can finally use this equation for the next one. If we want to know the frequency, we can say energy equals h nu, where nu is the frequency, right? If you want to say hf, that's fine too, I don't care. And so here we can plug this in and we can say that we want to rearrange it to solve for the frequency. So we can say that the energy divided by Planck's constant equals the frequency. And that's easy enough to solve. You can look up Planck's constant, right? And you can look up the energy from the previous problem and you can say 4.084 times 10 to the negative 19 uh, joules all over Planck's constant, which is six. You'll be given Planck's constant, right? It's on the data sheet times 10 to the negative. That's a really small number, and the units are joules per second, which if you crank this out, the joules will cancel. You're left with one over seconds, which is another way of writing hertz, right? The frequency. And so I got 6.16, I think I got three, six, yeah, times 10 to the 14th hertz. Easy enough. Now, wavelength, totally up to you. You could solve it the same way. You could use E equals uh, HC over lambda. Just note that the wavelength you get here will be in meters. That's really important as a result of joules. Or you could have solved it as simply as what? Uh, speed of light is equal to uh, the wavelength times the frequency, right? If you like F for frequency, or you could say nu. Uh, crank that out, I get something like um, the wavelength is going to be equal to what the speed of light divided by the frequency and I can crank that out as 2.9989 times 10 to the eighth meters per second, right? There are meters here, that's really important. Divided by the frequency, which is 6.163 times 10 to the 14th hertz, right? That's from up here. And I get something on the order of, what did I get? 4.8 six four times ten to the seventh meters and if you want to convert that uh, which I often do just to check my estimation that's going to be roughly a few hundred nanometers which seems to make sense to me that looks good so make sure you can do those calculations those are definitely fair game and, and quite quite straightforward the last question I think is more just vocabulary uh, sketch, sketch the shape of the atomic orbital with L equals 1. Well, that's P, right? Remember, S equals 0, P equals 1, and D equals 2. And in this case, uh, I'll say you can draw any of them. This is going to be the dumbbell shape. There you go. Maximum number of electrons that can occupy N equals 3. Well, N equals 3 composed of the uh, S orbital, the 3p subshell, right, plus the 3d. So if you do 2 plus 6 plus 10, that's going to be 18 maximum electrons. So there you go. And then finally, why are only two electrons in an orbital? You know, so if you have one s, you can do one up, one down. So by the definition of the spin quantum number, right, in the in Hund's rule, um, electrons can only have positive one-half or minus one-half as their quantum number for their spin, and no electron can have the same quantum number set, so you have to be stuck with one is positive and one is negative, and those are your only choices, so um, maximum of two because of the definition of those solutions to the Schrodinger equation. There you go. I hope this has helped. I know I went through it kind of quickly for some, maybe not as quickly as you would have liked for others, but this is already about 30 minutes and I don't want to make videos longer than that. So I hope this has helped you. Um, again, you can speed through things. I know my handwriting got a little goofy at times, but I hope this has helped uh, you build your confidence and, and your, your lowered stress level going into that first exam. I really hope you can do well. Show me what you can do. You know tee off on it and, 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 and you know, hopefully earn the grade that you want to earn. So take care and I will see you in class.